I think it would be useful if you were to download the packet tracer uh, week two activities to your PC. And we will be doing some of these. I'm hoping we can do three or four labs today, and then we'll do the rest of them next week. So we're starting a bit early with chapter two, which is good. It's a long chapter. And I do want to take uh, our time uh, covering some of the very basic and very important topics that are covered in chapter two. Any questions about anything before we start? Okay. So remember the, uh, the rule mute, unless uh, you want to say something and I encourage you to interrupt me along the way. Let's emulate a classroom environment as much as we can. Uh, but if you could mute your mic, uh, we would all appreciate it. So let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Good morning. And I know this is only week uh, one, but we have nine weeks to cover 11 chapters. And we're going to start in chapter two today, which is fairly long. And uh, hopefully we can stay ahead so we can cover all the chapters. And my plan is to cover all the chapters, but hopefully we can cover them uh, adequately uh, with time to do labs and answer questions and all of that stuff. So let's go ahead and start with few slides and then we're gonna stop and do labs. And I hope this is how the rest of this course is gonna go. Few slides, lab, few slides, lab. So Edge Router, this is the router that connects your home, your enterprise to the internet. And they are showing us three different models, a single router approach. That's a very basic, very simple. This is what you have inside your house and what I have inside my house and what some small businesses have. They just have a single router that connects them to the internet. And that single router does the routing, does the firewall, does lots of other services as well, DHCP and so on. And for medium size to larger enterprises, a single router is not enough. You don't really wanna put too much load on that single router. So you will have to have a minimum of two. One router that connects the enterprise to the internet and another device that does security. We talked about ASA, Adaptive Security Appliance on uh, Tuesday and uh, ASA or an ASA like device are very, very common, super common. And almost always this is the device that sits behind the router that connects the enterprise to the internet. And it focuses on security, which is the focus for this course. And sometimes, some enterprises want to put another router behind it, especially if you have a DMZ. Now, before we move on, does everyone know what a DMZ is? A demilitarized zone. And we're not talking war here, we're talking networking. So this is a network that sits on the other side of the firewall, on the other side of the router. And that's where companies put uh, servers that uh, they want the outside world to have access to. So they don't want to drill too many holes into their firewalls. And we do drill an awful lot of holes into our firewalls, but they want to mitigate that. They want to minimize that. And one good way of doing this is to create this DMZ area where enterprises will place servers that they want their employees, uh, customers, uh, partners, et cetera, to have access to without having to go inside the enterprise network. Three areas of router security. Uh, the first one and super important one is physical security. I keep saying there is no security without physical security. You have to have physical security. And this is why if you were to go to any company and you want to walk into their data center, their data center has locked doors. Usually you have to use multi-factor authentication 
to get authenticated before you can walk in. They have cameras. They want to see who's coming in, who's going out, because physical security is super important. And then when we talk about these super large data centers, uh, I showed you some pictures on Tuesday. They look like jails. They look like prisons. And that's probably one of the very few places where you would see armed guards. And that is all about physical security and high walls and fences. And then they have cameras and sensors and multi-factor authentication to physically protect the computers and the network devices. The one in the middle talk, talks about router operating system and configuration file security. And of course, those are very, very important because someone could replace the OS with another OS that has uh, security holes in it, and that would be a huge issue, and the configuration file as well, because this is how the device is configured. And I will show you in a later lab how we can do that with the iOS operating system. And router hardening uh, system hardening, they're basically talking about making it hard for someone to break into it. So you're using multi-factor authentication, you're using long passwords, uh, you are delaying how fast they can log on. Uh, you say after a few failed attempts, we're going to block you from logging on for five minutes or indefinitely until you call help desk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll be doing this or some of this today. And that is router hardening. And sometimes it's called a, a system hardening if we're talking about servers. Any questions so far? All right. This is a fabulous slide, everybody. It doesn't look like it, but it really is. And it's trying to put uh, their arms around chapter two. So secure administrative access. So we have, and this is true for all devices, not just routers, uh, but here we're talking about routers and switches. Secure administrative access, restrict device accessibility. Absolutely, positively, you know, you want to restrict who has access, especially who has admin access to the device. And network devices are different from servers. If you have a, a file server, if you have a print server, if you have a database server, application server, etc., those are computers that are used by dozens, hundreds of people. And they need different permissions based on what their need is. So if we're talking about a file server, I need read-write access to my folder, but I certainly don't want write access to your folder, and you may not even want to give me read access to your folder, but we both may need read access to some other folder. So uh, permissions are going to be different there. When we talk about network devices, yes, dozens, hundreds of, hundreds of people are using these devices, but they don't log on, they don't really uh, configure those devices, and a very small number of people configure those devices. And usually, they are system administrators, and usually they have full privilege to do whatever they want. So network devices are different from servers that are used uh, and accessed by a very large number of people, and we still want to restrict accessibility. Log. Uh, and account for all access, and this is a standard. You want to make sure that uh, everyone that is logging on is being captured in a log file, uh, what times they logged on, what times they logged off. And if they were to touch some sensitive areas, you also want to log that. If someone was trying to modify a configuration file, you want to capture you know, that Cody logged on on Thursday at 9 and modified the configuration file at 9.15. And that way, if something bad happens afterward, we know who to go and talk to. So, uh, and you don't want to use generic accounts. So let me stop here and talk about generic accounts for a minute. Generic accounts are a terrible idea. We do it a lot in school, but you don't want to do it in a uh, production environment. And meaning that you have an account called admin or administrator, and then you have 10 different people that use it. The problem with a generic account is who did what? There is no accountability. You have 10 people that are sharing the same account and you don't, and yes, we are logging, which is wonderful, but we don't know which one of the 10 different individuals did this or that. 
So make sure everyone has a unique account. They may have admin privilege and we are logging and we know Zico did this and Alex did that and Anne did something else. And this is really important. Authenticate access, okay, that is standard. And in many areas these days, we use multi-factor authentication and we wanna make sure we have a strong password. And uh, if someone failed to log on uh, three times in five minutes, we wanna block that account, et cetera. Authorize is okay. You know, now we know this is Zico. What is Zico allowed to do? Uh, is Zico allowed to do anything Zico wants to do, or are there some restrictions, constraints on what Zico can do? And this is what Authorize is, and we will cover this in this chapter. Uh, present legal notification. So when you log onto the device, you want to be presented with a legal notification saying this is a private system. If you were to do something illegal, we will uh, take legal action, etc. And this is really important because there was a case, and you can Google it if you want, some years back, where a black hat uh, hacker, a cracker, unethical hacker, uh, managed to get access to a router. And the uh, notification that came up was welcome. And then he was caught, and they went to court, and he told the judge, but your honor, you know, the message said welcome and the judge threw the case out because the message did say welcome didn't say you know this is a private system and it should only be used for private purposes etc cetera, etc cetera. so we should take that message of the day very very seriously and make sure it's crafted in a in a legal way that if for whatever reason we may end up in court one day it will stand up in court and then ensure confidentiality. And I think by now you all know whenever we talk about confidentiality, we're talking about encryption. So we wanna encrypt. We wanna encrypt the data that is sitting on the server. And we also want to encrypt the communication. And this is why I keep saying, don't use Telnet, don't use FTP, don't use HTTP, they're insecure. Use their equivalent secure protocol, uh, SSH, uh, SFTP, uh, HTTPS and so on. So um, you want to encrypt the data on the box and you want to encrypt the communication between your remote computer and those devices you're accessing remotely. Really, really great slide. And as a system administrator, everybody, you want to check each and every one of those boxes. Questions? All right. Secure local and remote access. So if you were to purchase a switch or a router, uh, you may wanna use a Yoast cable, a serial cable to configure this device. And we've covered this before and we'll cover it again. So uh, you will have a laptop or a desktop and you will connect to the network device using a Yoast slash serial cable and you would run a terminal emulator program on your computer and then you can access the device and do what you want. And there are means to make sure not anybody can go and plug a serial cable into a device and access it. So we will I wanna make sure we secure that access. Remote access, and here they're talking about Telnet, VTY is Telnet and SSH. And I already told you, don't use Telnet. We will cover Telnet, but don't use it because even the account and the password will go over the network unencrypted. And anyone with a simple uh, packet sniffing tool can see the account and the password. So use SSH, which adds encryption. And then down below is a serial connection using a modem. Uh, I want you to imagine, you know, you are managing a remote site and they have a router and usually you manage this router using TCP IP, but if for whatever reason you can't access that remote box using TCP IP, you don't really want to get in your car and drive over there. If you do have a modem, then you can dial in. And I know uh, we don't use modems, dial up modems anymore, but you'll be surprised how many people still use them to access remote routers because you don't really need a big pipe uh, to do that. And it's just a backup method to
to access those remote devices if you're unable to access them using um, a TCP IP. And I can tell you stories from my days at HP when we weren't able to access routers in uh, Dallas from Houston, and we relied on the modems uh, to do that. Good, so we will do some labs here. Okay. And I'm gonna do one more lab, sorry, one more slide, and then we'll move into web, one lab, our first lab. So if you want to manage these uh, networking devices using TCP IP over the network, uh, you wanna use a dedicated VLAN. So we've talked about VLANs before, we'll continue to talk about VLANs. VLANs are the norm. There isn't a single enterprise on planet Earth that doesn't use VLANs. And you want to have a management VLAN, a VLAN that is dedicated for management purposes. And then you can manage those devices uh, using TCP IP and a dedicated VLAN. Are we good? All right, I'm gonna do this lab and I would like you to watch me. And of course, I want you to do these labs on your own and take your time doing the labs and make sure everything makes sense. And I hope that I've given you enough instructions to do that. But let's go ahead and do the very first lab. So this is from chapter two and we have a long list of stuff we wanna cover in chapter two and we're starting here. And so I have, and this is what I like to do with the labs, snap the Microsoft Word document to the left and snap the packet tracer file to the right. And that way I can read and do at the same time. So scenario one is we wanna secure the console connection is the serial cable connection, the Yoast cable connection. And I'm gonna start from the top. And if you have any questions, please do ask. Uh, host name R1, I'm just giving it a name. No IP domain lookup. I'm basically saying that please don't go and try to resolve this name using DNS. Because if you were to mistype something, the iOS operating system is gonna say, oh, are you trying to talk to this computer? Let me try and resolve it on IP. And here goes two minutes. So I'm saying, no, don't do that. And then banner message of the day, this is the legal notification I was talking about earlier. And this is just me, this is not nearly enough, not nearly sufficient. And usually this is something crafted by legal experts, lawyers, uh, but it's good enough for what we're doing today. And then we wanna enable a minimum password length. In fact, I'm gonna go back and do another slide, stay with me. Okay, so this is the slide is talking about strong password and I think we all understand the importance of a strong password. And I think on Tuesday we talked about how do we crack passwords and I said method number one, guess. Method number two, dictionary attack. And method number three is brute force. And brute force is when we try every single combination. And this is where the password length makes a huge difference. Because if the password, and I will show you this a little bit later on, is short, then it's not gonna take very long to crack it using brute force. And as the password gets longer and longer, it's gonna get harder and harder to crack that password using brute force. So if you're using a one character password, and I've seen those in production, believe it or not. Okay, that's eight bits. One character is eight bits. Two to the power eight is 256. That's 256 tries. That's a fraction of a fraction of a second. And they will crack that password. If you were to use a four character password, and those were adequate passwords a long time ago, that's 32 bit. Two to the power 32 is 400. 4.28 billion tries, everybody. So you can see as you add more characters, you have more combinations and using brute force is gonna take longer. It's gonna take an awful longer time to crack a 32 bit password versus an eight bit. And of course, four character isn't sufficient anymore. So here they're saying a bare minimum of 10 and I'm beginning to see 12 and 14 and 16. 
and 10 is 80 bits. And that's two to the power 80. And that is a lot of different tries before we can crack that password using brute force. Okay. And here they are showing us that the password is going to be encrypted. And I will talk about that in just a few minutes. Okay. And we're coming to hashing. So let's do one lab and then I want to come back and talk about hashing. And hashing is a concept that is used a lot in networking and computer science. And it's really important for this course, for any course that you understand hashing and you understand the difference between these different hashing algorithms. So let's go back to the lab. Okay. So we have, and now enable minimum password and encrypt password in the config file. So security password minimum length is 10. I'm saying the password should be a bare minimum of 10 characters. Service password encryption. This is mean if you're not using secret to create your password, the password is going to be saved in the configuration file unencrypted. And anyone that's looking over your shoulder can see the password. And we wanna prevent that. And we can prevent that by encrypting that password. And this is what this password encryption does. Uh, and this is a very poor encryption, but at least, you know, if someone is watching over your shoulder, they will not be able to see that password. And then coming down to the console zero, I'm saying I'm gonna enable a single console connection, executive timeout one, which means if you don't use it for a minute, it's gonna kick you out. And maybe this is, you know, too short of a window, we're talking about the session window, but this is a great security tool because sometimes we connect to a device and then we walk away and we stay connected. And here I'm saying, if I walk away after one minute, kill the connection, and then they will have to re-enter the password. Password one, two, three. So let's go ahead and do this. But for my first try, I'm going to comment out the password encryption just to show you what it's gonna do. Uh, where was I? Here. Good, everybody. So I've left everything as is, except for the password encryption. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste. And you wanna do this on your own. And right now the router is only configured for the IP, doesn't really have any other configuration and paste it and now if I was to do show run you can see the configurations I've made and I want to show you the password so this is this configuration down here and you can see it in this configuration file okay and if someone was sitting next to me, someone is walking behind me, they can look at what I'm doing and they can see, oh, the password is console123, which is a horrible password, but whatever the password is, they would be able to see it. And this is what this password encryption does. So it's not gonna encrypt the stored password, it's gonna encrypt the presented password. So it's gonna continue to be stored unencrypted. However, every time you do show run, it's going to encrypt that password so people can see what the password is. And now I can use console to log in. So I can go to LT1. And as you can see, I'm connected using a Yoast cable, a serial cable, and TCP IP as well. And this is my terminal emulator that is built into Packet Tracer. I'm going to accept the default, hit enter. And it's asking me for the password, which is console123. And I'm in. And now I can do whatever I want. So let's move down to scenario two. And I will come back and I will re-enable this password encryption. And here we want to enable Telnet. And of course, we don't want to use Telnet. I've already covered this. Uh, but I'm covering it in this lab and then I'll show you how to use SSH. And SSH is what you want to do to remotely log on to any device. So let's start from the top. We're creating an account. Oh, one more thing they tell me to do here. 
is let's say new new user oh sorry username username Zico Secret, okay, and one, two, three. And you can see I got an error message saying password is too short. And that's because we said we wanted the password to be 10 characters long. But since I'm here, let me come back and fix this. Okay, Cisco one, two, three, four, five. So I just created an account and I used Secret. And Secret will always encrypt. So you don't have to rely on the service password encryption to encrypt any time, any password you create with secret. And it is also a much better encryption. And now if I was to do do show run and find Zico, and you can see it's already encrypted even though I don't have this service password encryption turned on. But I will need this password service encryption for the console password. And maybe this is a good time to apply this command. So I'm gonna copy it. Everybody, let's see what's gonna happen to console one, two, three, and paste it. And do show run. And now you can see what happened to the console password. So we didn't encrypt the stored password. The stored password is still console123. And this is a very old way of capturing and storing passwords, which is terrible, but it's still being used by iOS. And I will talk about how newer operating systems, more modern operating systems do it. But now if someone was to walk behind me, they will see this long string which is what we converted that binary, long binary string into hex. Uh, and this is encrypted. So one thing that would be useful to look at right now is username Zico secret five. Okay. And this is when hashing algorithm. And then if we were to go down to the console password, you can say password seven. And that is a different hashing algorithm. And I wanted to talk about that. And do you remember the reason why it timed out is if you remember, I said exact time out when, which means if I don't use this console for a minute time out, well, this is what it does, it timed out. And now if I was to hit enter, it's gonna prompt me for the password, which is exactly what we want. And this is a very good security practice. And maybe one minute is too aggressive, maybe five minutes, is, is better than one minute, uh, but it depends. And the answer uh, often is it depends. It depends on what kind of a router, what is that router being used for, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can decide what is a good timeout period for that device. So let's scroll down and look at the Telnet configuration. So we're gonna create a local account called admin. And I already talked about the importance of having every single system administrator have a separate account. So this would be a generic account. It's good for educational purposes. If you're the only person accessing the box, this is good. If this is a box that is being administered by multiple people, this becomes a generic account and generic accounts uh, are a terrible idea. It's just a matter of time before you have a crisis in your hands because something bad is gonna happen and they would want to know who did it and, and you're not gonna know because it's a generic account that is being used by multiple people. So you wanna give each person a unique account and you can give them admin privileges. So down here, it says we want to block for 30 seconds when three failed attempts within 60 seconds. And I think we're all familiar with this. So we're saying that um, if someone tried to log on unsuccessfully three times without within a minute, 
then block the account for 30 seconds. And again, you wanna tweak this. And I don't think 30 seconds is enough. Usually it's five minutes. And this is in case uh, a brute force attack is being launched against this device. And we wanna slow it down. And if every, if after each three tries, they have to wait five minutes, they're never ever gonna crack that password. Login delay. Login delay basically means that every second you can try another login. And if we were to delay it for 10 seconds, then it means you can only try to log on every 10 seconds. Again, this is to mitigate a brute force attack. Uh, and this feature is not enabled in Packet Tracer, we can't do it. But between these two features, you know, we are mitigating brute force attack. We're saying that if every time they fail to log on after three tries within one minute, they have to wait for a number of seconds or minutes. And if they can only attempt a single log in every 10 seconds, well, this is pretty good protection against the brute force attack. And then we have to configure the VTY, okay. And we also gave it an exact time out of one. I believe the default is 10. And then if you are to remotely log on to a device, when you want to go into privileged mode, you have to have a password. So we created the privileged mode password. So you will be able to tell that. However, as soon as you type enable, uh, it's going to ask you for the privileged mode password. And if you don't have one set, you're going to get an error message and you would have to configure it. So let me copy and paste. And now it's asking me for the console. And become very familiar with those passwords because we use them for many, many labs. Paste. And if I was to do show run, and you can see the enable secret, and this is the password we're using for the privileged mode. And it is encrypted, and you can see it's longer than, hold on for a second. You can see it's longer than seven, everybody. You can sit and count the characters. This is seven and this is five and you can see five is a lot longer and that's because it's a better more secure hashing algorithm that produces a longer hash key and that is good and i want to talk about hashing in a few minutes and now i can tell net from here so i'm using tcp ip ping 192.168.1.1. I can get to the router and I can tell net to 192.168.1.1 and username admin, password Cisco12345. And now if I was to type EN, okay, that's because I came in with privileged 15. And privilege 15 is an administrator privilege. So it said, yep, you know, you're good enough. Uh, but if I was to come in with a lower privilege, it would have prompted me for, for uh, a privileged mode password. And I already said, don't use Telnet. I'm showing you how to use it. You want to know how to use it, but don't use it. It's just terribly insecure. If there is a device on this local area network that is sniffing the packets, they will easily see the account and the password. And now they have the admin account and password. And that's a problem. So before I talk about hashing, I would like to know if you have any questions. We will come back and do SSH. And it timed out because I have a time out of one minute. Is this all familiar to you? Yeah, it is. Okay, very good, thank you. Anyone else, any questions? 
So let's talk about hashing. And please, you know, uh, uh, get your brain around hashing. It's really important that you understand hashing for a gazillion different uh, reasons. And I will show you one right now. So we all know about segments, packets, and frames. And we all know the frame has a payload, which consists of a piece of the packet, maybe the entire packet. And the packet consists of a piece of the segment, maybe the entire segment, if it's a small segment. And to come back to the frame, the frame has a header and a footer. And the packet has a header and the segment has a header. And in the frame header, the two most important fields are the source and destination MAC addresses. And we have a trailer. And we all know the trailer is the CRC, cyclical redundancy check. And that is a hash code. And what the sending device does before it sends out the frame is it takes the payload, it puts it through a hashing algorithm. The hashing algorithm produces a hash key. And this is what goes into the trailer. And then the devices along the way, including the receiving the device, when they receive the frame, they will take the same payload, they will put it through the same hashing algorithm, they will produce a hash key, and then they will compare those two keys to one another. If the keys are the same, then it's deemed that this frame has good integrity. And if the, the two hash keys are different, then it's deemed that intentionally or unintentionally something bad happened along the way and the frame will be discarded. So this is just one of many, many scenarios where uh, hashing is used. And I said newer operating systems, they don't really store the password as you typed it. So if I was to change my password in my Windows 10 or you were to change your password in your Windows 10 and the new password is going to be password one, two, three, you don't really store password one, two, three into the system because the system administrator has the permission to access any part of that operating system and they would be able to see the password. And that is a security nightmare. Okay. And even if you were to encrypt password one, two, three, well, the system administrator can decrypt it using the same encryption protocol and then they would see the password. So we don't do that. Modern operating systems don't do that. So whenever you type a new password, like password one, two, three, you put it through a hashing algorithm, you produce a hash key, and this is what you store into the system. You store the hash key into the system. And then next time you wanna log on and it prompts you for your account and your password and you type password one, two, three, the operating system is going to hash the password, is gonna generate a hash key, and then it's gonna compare that against the stored hash key. And if they're the same, then it says, yep, you are who you say you are, and it will allow you in. And if not, uh, the login will fail. And this is what all modern operating systems do, not iOS, you know, Windows, Linux, Mac, Unix, et cetera, et cetera. They all hash the password, and that's good. And uh, the iOS, has been evolving over the years. And now they also have a mechanism where you can hash the password as well, instead of storing it uh, unencrypted like we saw before for the console password. So let's talk about hashing. So I'm gonna do hashing MD5. MD5 is one hashing algorithm. There's many. I just wanna go to images. Okay, and this is a good slide. Okay, so let's take a look at this slide, everybody. So we have a payload, a string, and the string can be anything. It can be one character or can be an entire textbook. It doesn't really matter, you know, how short or how long that string is. So we have a string. We put it through a hashing algorithm, and it's going to produce a hash key. And the hash key will always be the same length for that uh, hashing algorithm. And each and every time you put the same string through the hashing algorithm, it will always produce the same exact hash key. So Fox will always produce this hash key. 
and the red fox jumps over the blue dog will always produce this hash key. Always, 100% of the time. Otherwise, we have a problem. Okay. And then if you were to make any minor change, and this is what the next three lines are showing us, it's going to produce a different hash key because the string is different and it's going to calculate a different hash key. Now, the length of the hash key is really important. Uh, this is how we guarantee high integrity. And I'm going to give you a simple scenario and then we'll add complexity to it along the way to explain why a longer hash key is more secure. So let's start by a one byte hash key. So we have an eight bit. Two to the power eight is 256. So no matter what the string is, no matter what the payload is, the result is always going to be one of 256 answers because we're using an eight bit key. Well, this is a huge problem because cryptographers, and I'm not one, they're always looking for two or more strings that can produce the same hash key. And if they can find two or more strings that produce the same hash key, then the battle is won or lost, depending on your point of view. Am I making sense, everybody? So we want to minimize the number of different strings that can produce the same hash key. Ideally, we don't want any two different strings to produce the same hash key because that becomes an issue. So if we were to make the hash key 32 bits, 2 to the power 32, 4.28 billion combinations, and now you know the odds are much, much lower, but still for a computer, 4.28 billion isn't an awful lot. It's an awful lot for you and me, not for a computer, okay? using you know fancy cpus and algorithms and so on they can crack this fairly quickly and you know once you crack the hashing algorithm it's useless now you know we can use it to find out what the original string used to be so this is why the length of the hash key is very important and when we start looking at the newer uh, hashing algorithms you can see they just keep getting longer you know, they went from 64 to 128 to 256 to 512. And each time we add more bits to the hash key, the hash code, we're reducing the probability of two strings producing the same hash key. Because if you guys remember a minute ago, I said cryptographers are always looking to see if they can use two different strings to produce the same hash key because once they do this, they have something to work with. And if they can use three, four, five different strings to produce the same hash key, then the battle is won or lost. It's over, okay? This hashing algorithm is gonna be considered weak and it would be very easy to crack. Any questions about hashing? We don't really need to understand the algorithm. I don't, nor do I need to. I just need to understand hashing. You take a payload, you put it through an algorithm, it produces a hash key. The longer the hash key, the likelihood is it's more secure. We're good? Okay, so let me go back to where we were. So let's come over here. Console, one, two, three. Now it's prompting me, priv mode one, two, three. And those passwords don't change for all of these different labs. Show run. Very good. So let's go back to the top. So this is using secret five and it's using an MD5 hashing algorithm. An MD5 hashing algorithm produces 128-bit hash key and it's considered to be on the weak side in 2020. It used to be excellent, very good. It's no longer excellent, very good because computers keep getting uh, faster and faster and cheaper and more and more people have access to fancy computers that can crack these longer hash key fairly quickly. And the same thing is true here. You know, secret five, five is telling us that we are using MD5 hashing algorithm to produce a 128-bit uh, hash key. And then let's go down to the console. 
okay? And this is using a Cisco hashing algorithm to encrypt this password. And I wanna show you how easy it is to crack. If you guys remember, it's console one, two, three. So I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna go back to my friend Google and I'm gonna type Cisco crack password seven. And let me come over here, type in the hashed password, the encrypted password crack. How long did that take? So the faster, the weaker is the algorithm. And I don't have a supercomputer here at home. I just have a, a PC like you have a PC. And it took what, a second to convert this hashed key into console one, two, three. So let's do five. If you remember, we said five is much more secure. It uses 128 bit hashing key. So let's go back here and let's grab one of the five. Here it is, this whole string all the way, including the dot. This is not the end of the sentence. This is a part of it. Copy and come back over here. And it says type five and crack. Wow. Okay, that's pretty scary. <laughs> okay, it's more secure. It's not much more secure. And that's because it's an easy password to get, everybody. It's not because it's an equally as poor of a hashing algorithm. It's because the password is just too easy. Cisco one, two, three, four, five, that's a very easy password. And this is the importance. We didn't even get to the, uh, to the hard way of cracking a password. So let me try the other password and see, come back here. And this is for Zico, copy and correct the password. Okay. They were both the same key. I'm not sure if you noticed that. Ah, okay. So thank you. Here we go. All right. So this is a lesson on not using easy passwords because easy passwords can easily be correct. Okay. So maybe we can come back and create another password. In fact, let's do it, everybody. And let's just stay here for a minute because this is a security course. So let's come over here and console one, two, three, priv mode one, two, three, Comp T and a uh, um, user Frank secret uh, X Y Z one two three lowercase uppercase okay good enough and let's see what we did here do show run and let me grab Frank's new password. Copy, come back here. Here we go. Okay, it's taking longer, right everybody? That's because it's a much harder password. And now it's trying brute force. So it's no longer doing a dictionary attack. It's no longer doing an easy way of trying to figure the password saying, okay, I'm gonna try every possible combination. And this may take five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour. I don't really know how long it will take, but it's gonna keep going until it cracks it using brute force. And brute force is always, always gonna work. The only question is, is it gonna take a year, two, five, 20 years? And that depends on the length of the password. And we covered that before. So you're using you know, a four character password. Well, it's not gonna take very long. That's a maximum of 4.28 billion tries. That's you know under a minute. And if you're using a 16 character password, well, 
brute force is going to take a very long time to crack that because we're talking about a massive uh, number of uh, trials here. Any questions on this? And I would love for you to experiment with it. It's still going and it may go for a long time. It's not an easy password to crack. We're good? Okay, let's do SSH. Okay, so SSH is secure. I'm gonna come back to my table. Okay, Telnet does not use SSL or TLS, and these are encryption protocols. Uh, SSH does use SSL, TLS to encrypt. It uses the private and public key. It uses the PKI, public key infrastructure to do that. And this is what you and I and every single human being on planet Earth does many, 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 many times each day. Every time we go to Gmail, every time we go to Facebook, every time we wanna purchase something, we're using HTTPS and HTTPS is HTTP over SSL. This is what the S stands for, it's over SSL. So we have to create a, uh, a private key and a public key in order for SSL TLS to work in IPsec. And we're gonna spend some really quality time with IPsec later on in this course. Uh, also uses this PKI infrastructure, but it's quite different from SSL and TLS and it operates at a completely different layer, layer three. So here the application has to call SSL. HTTP doesn't, HTTPS does. Down here, it doesn't really matter what the application wants. It's gonna have to go through layer three and it's gonna get encrypted and decrypted. Um, and if you are using an application that's using SSL, then you're gonna encrypt twice and decrypt twice. And we do that all the time and that's no problem. So let's come back to scenario three. Mm -hmm. So first, I don't want every computer to be able to SSH into a router. So I wanna narrow it down in this case to a single computer. This is the system administrator IP address and we only want that IP address to be able to SSH. And that's an excellent idea. So I'm creating an ACL, and I hope you remember ACLs from previous classes, and I'm saying permit this one IP. And if you remember ACLs, the very last statement is deny all. So I'm permitting one, two, and then I'm denying everybody else. And for that uh, PKI, I need to create a domain name and I'm using cisco.com and I'm creating that private public key and it's gonna ask me how long do you want this key to be and this is why we have to do this in two steps. So I'm gonna do this step one and then step two is to reply to the answer and finish. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna use a 2048 bit key and the longer the key, the more secure this private public key is. And then I'm saying transport is SSH. So I'm still using the same virtual interface, VTY for Telnet and for SSH, but I'm explicitly saying I wanna use it with SSH, not with Telnet, which is good. And timeout one, and I talked plenty about timeout before, okay. And down here, I'm saying only allow this one IP access. So we created the ACL, we have to use it. So up here we created it and down here we're using it. So let's go ahead and copy and paste down to here. Timed out again. And you can see it's asking for the length of the key. 512 is way, way too short. 1024 is way, way too short for PKI. So uh, 2048 and up. And then I'm gonna give it the answer and finish. 
and I'm done. And now if I was to do show run, you can see I've configured VTY. I'm only allowing this ACL in, okay? And I'm using it with SSH. And if I was to scroll up, I can see the Here it is. This is the ACL. And while we're talking about ACLs, I want to show you this ACL, which I didn't create, and it was created by the iOS. Okay. And this is for when we go into what's called a quiet mode. So remember, after three tries, it's going to block access for uh, 30 seconds. Well, those 30 seconds is called a quiet time, uh, quiet mode, which means no one can log on. Uh, not only that one individual, but no one can log on because we are in quiet mode. And this is the ACL that enforces the quiet mode. And if you were to look at it, it says deny, deny, deny. Okay. And that's because we are blocking people from logging on. And of course, if you're a system administrator, there is always a way for the system administrator to access. So there's a way to work around the quiet mode. Um, but I wanted to highlight the ACL that enforces the quiet mode. So let's come here and test it. So if I was to go to WEN2, WEN2 is the only computer that is allowed SSH permission. SSH minus L admin 192.168.12, sorry, 11. And the password is Cisco12345. And I'm in. And this is the message of the day. We talked about this. Okay, and now I can do whatever I want. So let me exit and let me fail three times. And now if I try to log on, you see, I can't because I am in quiet mode and I want to show you the quiet mode. So log in, and you can see we are in quiet mode. And as of two seconds ago, I only had 11 seconds left in quiet mode, two seconds left in quiet mode, and now I am back to so log in. I am back to normal mode. Did you guys see that? Normal mode means you can log on. Quiet mode means we're in quiet mode. However, system administrators always have a way to work around the quiet uh, mode. Otherwise, we have a serious problem if the system administrator cannot access the router or the switch. And you want to limit it to one or two IPs, just like we did here. So only these one or two remote computers can access the router, the switch. And now if I was to go back, and now it's going to prompt me for a password. And now come back and we're back in quiet mode for the next 25 seconds because we said we want the quiet mode to be 30 seconds long. Questions? So adding the ACL is new, I believe. I don't know if we've done this before. And limiting access to a single IP is new. So we've done SSH before. We've taken it one step further and said, we don't want anybody to SSH. We only want those few devices that are used by the system administrators to be able to SSH. And you can see this is much more secure than, yes, we enforce SSH, but anybody can SSH from anywhere. I'm going to stop and answer your questions because we've covered a lot of ground. And I want to see if you have any questions on anything we've covered, including hashing, because hashing is used often, a lot. It's an integrity check. And we always talk about confidentiality, which is encryption. And we talk about integrity, which is almost always hashing. Is there anything else in this lab? This is it for that first lab.
Question? I think for just the the hashing the SSH is pretty clear. It's kind of just the the review, seeing the, the the hashing keys and how I'm not sure if it's how easy that they were to be decrypted just based on how hashing works, or if it's just that they've had so many that they just have a large repository. But it's still, when we worked with hashing at OSU, that was a pretty big deal. Yep. Thank you. And remember, easy passwords are easy to guess. And this is why we want to enforce password complexity, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, characters. And that way, when you're forced into brute force, remember guessing, dictionary attack, brute force. And when you are forced into a brute force, you know, the longer the password, uh, the longer it's going to take to crack. And I didn't expect to tell you the truth. It's going to crack Cisco 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in less than a second. But that's how easy it is to crack those easy passwords. They're just very easy to crack. So it's a good password for the lab because it's easy to remember. Uh, it's a terrible password in a production environment because it's easy to figure out. And I'm sure all of you have been to the website, you know, how secure is my password? So if you haven't been there and you're curious about your own password, you know, just go to Google and type uh, how secure is my password. And it's not asking you for your account and you can type a similar password to yours. So, I'm going to go ahead and type in my password. And it will take roughly 16 billion years. And knowing I will not be around 16 billion years from now, I'm not terribly worried about it. But that's for a, an average computer. If I work for the NSA, the National Security Agency, with their many, many supercomputers, it, it's not going to take 16 billion years but it will still take some time. And you will be surprised when I teach the digital literacy class and I ask students to type in their passwords. You'll be surprised how many students will tell me, you know, two minutes, four minutes. Well, that's how long it will take a standard computer to crack your password. So you want to use a secure password. Questions? If it all makes sense, wonderful. But if it doesn't, ask. Because we're moving on. We have an awful lot of material to cover in 285. And this is lab one. I just had a quick question for you. Go ahead, Cody. Um, there's uh, services like LastPass and things like that that auto, you know, you can generate. 20 character random string passwords. How are passwords of that length and complexity managed or, or stored? Like passwords that you, you can't necessarily memorize, how are they stored? So when you're logging in to a device like that? It, 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 it is, it is a, a very, very good question. I'll tell you what I do with my passwords, Cody. I'm not sure if this is the right answer or not. Because I can't remember all of my passwords, like all of you, you know, I have many, 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 too many accounts. And I have too many different passwords for these different accounts. And sometimes I'm forced into different passwords because this system, you know, doesn't accept this. This system insists on that. So I am forced to use different passwords. Uh, I put all of them into a Microsoft Word file and I encrypt the file. And I make sure to remember, you know, the file password. Because if I ever forget that password for the file where all of my passwords are encrypted, I'm in serious trouble. And of course, there are third party tools out there that will do that job for you. They will remember the account and the password for you and encrypt it in your system and automatically use it when you go to that website. Uh, however, uh, please remember those are software tools and they may have security holes uh, built into them. Is that what you would do 
sort of in a production environment have like a Word document that's encrypted? Is that typically what you would see? If it's encrypted, you will get away with it. So just okay. make sure it's encrypted. If it's okay. not encrypted, you know, you're asking for trouble. But most definitely don't write it in a piece of paper and put it under your keyboard. <laughs> and you'll be surprised, you know, how many people do this. And when people break into companies, that's the first thing they do. They lift the keyboards to see if the accounts and the passwords are there. So don't do that. Don't leave it unencrypted. But if you were to put it in a file and encrypt it with a good password, then at least, you know, you have a measure of protection. Uh, but 20 character password, that's a long password. And if you're forced into a brute force, you can do the math. Two to the power 20, it's going to take an awful long time for even a supercomputer to crack that password. Questions? Okay. Uh, do I have your permission to move on, cover a few more slides, do another lab, or do you want to take a break? What would you like? Uh, we can move on. OK, let's move on. Oh, from chapter one, I'm just going to show you this one slide. Chapter one, everybody. We covered this on uh, right here. So I said, in the good old days, we didn't have very many sophisticated tools, hacking tools, and we relied heavily on people having a lot of technical expertise. And we're saying now it's the opposite. You know, if you're a hacker, yeah, of course it helps if you have a, a lot of technical expertise, but you don't really have to because the tools are amazing. And I just showed you two. I just showed you two to crack a Cisco uh, level five and a level seven password. And you will be amazed how many tools are available out in the internet for free, for everyone to use for hacking purposes. And usually that's where people start. If you want to hack, that's where you would start. You would go to your friend Google and you will Google away and you'll be surprised what you find out there. Just be careful that they don't have a malware. Uh, it's not a Trojan horse. We talked about Trojan horses on Tuesday as well. Uh, but there's an awful lot of tools that are available for free on the internet for people to use for, for hacking purposes. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you don't have to have any expertise. It just means you don't have to be nearly as uh, expert as old crackers had to be before. So uh, essentially, programmers are eliminating hackers' intelligence or how intelligent or how resourceful they need to be by making easier tools for them to use. Very good. Very good. And I just showed you two easy ones that were super easy to find. So I want to stay here for a minute. So this is iOS. Remember I said the iOS is evolving from pretty crude passwords to much more sophisticated passwords. So enable algorithm type. And now we're talking about hashing algorithms. I talked about MD5. And in fact, uh, passwords level five use MD5. And as you can imagine, MD5 means this is the fifth version of MD, right? Everybody, we had MD1, MD2, MD3. MD5 is quite popular these days. And SHA is another super popular uh, hashing algorithm. And you can see this one is 256. And if you were to Google uh, SHA, and maybe we can do that for a minute, you can see, you know, SHA comes in many different flavors. And this is just one flavor. And 256 is talking about the hashing key. This is the length of the hashing key. And I said, the longer the hashing key is, the less likely that two different payloads are going to produce the same hash key. And if two or more payloads can produce the same hash key, this is like you know, a gold mine for cryptographers because now they can use this data to crack uh, the algorithm. Okay. And I did say we'll go and take a look. So let's take a, a quick look. Okay. Hashing algorithms. Okay. Is there a wiki for this? Okay. 
and you can read about it. Hash tables. I want to see if they list them. Nope. So let's go. Okay, very good. So this is a comparison of SHA functions. So we're talking about SHA0, SHA1, SHA2, SHA3. And you can see, you know, the uh, hashing key, um, it shrinks and grows. And the longer, the better. And here we have SHA512, 128, 256, 512. And of course, 512 is far more secure than 256. And that is much more secure than 128. So why not use 512 all the time? I'm asking you. If 512 is more secure, why don't we use it all the time? And the answer is, what is it you're trying to protect? OK, because there is a tax associated with a longer hash key. It's going to take longer to produce. So when you take that string, that payload, and you put it through the hashing algorithm, it's going to take longer to do the math and to produce that hash key. And what is it you're trying to protect? And you know, if it's something that isn't uh, super secure, then do you really need that level of security. How many locks do you want to have in your front door? Everybody, how many locks do you want to have in your uh, safe? How complex do you want that safe to be? So the most secure isn't always the best answer because it could be an overkill for what it is you're trying to protect. So we have to pick the hashing algorithm that makes sense for what we're trying to do. And later on in chapter five, you're gonna see we're gonna be using MD5. This guy right here was 128 bit, which is not nearly as long as 512, you know, to authenticate routers uh, wanting to exchange information with each other. And maybe for that purpose, MD5 is good enough. You know, we're not talking about money. We're not, you know, transferring billions of dollars between bank A and bank B. We just want router one to talk to router two. And for those purposes, 128-bit is probably good enough. It's not the most secure, but we have to remember what we're using it for. All right. So iOS is evolving. It started pretty crude, and now they're saying, look, you know, you can use much fancier hashing algorithms. All right, so this is where we're going to begin to see uh, some of the uh, packet tracer limitations. So this is message of the day. We we'll talk plenty about message of the day. We've covered this already. Log in, block for attempts within. So if you fail three times within one minute, block for so many seconds. We talked about the quiet period which isn't supported in packet tracer, uh, but just because a router or a switch went into a quiet period, meaning someone failed to log on successfully three times within 60 seconds, we don't want to block the administrators. So the administrators have to have a mean to log on. Okay. We did enable logging. If you remember when we were if you know your party's extension, you may dial it at any time. Otherwise, please choose from the following options. If you are calling about your appointment. OK. So uh, we did enable logging, and we were seeing these logging messages come up on the console, because that is the default uh, logging output. So when you're logging, you can, by default, log to the console, or you can log to a file. And in a production environment, you want to log to a file because the console is going to, the, the message is going to disappear from the console. 
So it's very, very important that you have a log file and that you log into a file, not only to the console. You can do a console and a file, but you want to do the file. And we'll talk more about logging later on. I did cover SSH. I said it uh, heavily uses the PKI infrastructure. So we have to build that before we can use it. Uh, when you go, I want to show you everybody. And this is really a good use of few minutes. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to linbenton.edu. This is sticking with PKI. And I'm going to more tools, developer tools, security, and view the certificate. And detail. And this is the digital certificate that is being used with the linbenton.edu website. And it's version three. Do you guys see SH, SHA-256? This is the hashing algorithm, 256 bits. And if we are to scroll down, we have a private key and a public key. And this is the public key. It's 2048 bits and it's public. This is it in hacks. So we're not trying to protect that. Nobody wants to protect their public key because it is their public key and they make it available for everybody. The one thing you're not gonna see in here is the private key because that is the key they are trying to protect. And very, very quickly, and it's really important that you remember this, the way this private public key works is whatever you encrypt with one key, you can only decrypt with the other key. So if you were to encrypt something with the public key, you can only decrypt it with private. If you were to encrypt with private, you can only decrypt with public. And this certificate is not a certificate that Lynn Benton produced. This is a certificate that they purchased, everybody. And let me see where did this come from. This is from issued by, do you guys see, DigiCert. And VeriSign is the 800 pound gorilla when it comes to uh, digital certificates. But there are lots of other companies that do this as well, including DigiCert. Okay. And is, when we, go ahead. That, um, is that something that Lynn Benton actually had to set up or is that part of their web presence, part of whatever, whoever's hosting or whatever is developing the Lynn Benton website but, that is kind of a package good. deal? Yeah, very, very good. And I will answer your question. I want you to look at the issue too. It's issued to lynnbenton.edu. Whether lynnbenton.edu is doing the work themselves or whether they outsourced it, you know, it was issued to lynnbenton.edu. Did I answer your question, Frank? Yeah. I, 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 didn't see, I didn't see that up there. Yeah. So it's basically saying, yep, this, this is Lynn Benton. Okay, you're, you're talking to Lynn Benton. And what's really important about this certificate is Lynn Benton didn't issue this certificate for themselves. They had to go to what's called a certificate authority, a CA. And then they purchased this and you can see it has a window of time that it's good for. And then before 11, 12, 2022, they better go back and obtain a new digital certificate with different private public keys. Uh, and usually the duration is one year and this one is three years, which, which is good and bad. Again, it depends what is it you're trying to secure. If you're a financial institution, I don't think you want a digital certificate that is good for multiple years. You may want to renew it more often because of the nature of the business that you do. Okay. So this is Lynn Benton. And when we were doing this on, uh, on our packet tracer, we generated our own. So all operating systems, including Windows 10, is capable of generating their own uh, digital certificate. Uh, it didn't come from a certificate authority. It's like giving, it's like making your own driver's license, making your own passport. It's not gonna be good if you wanna travel to Japan, but between you and your friends and family members, it may be good enough. So for testing purposes, you know, we generated our own digital certificate on that router or on a switch or on a computer. Just remember, those are fake 
digital certificates. They're good for testing purposes, not for production purposes. For production purposes, you would want to go to a certificate authority and obtain a legitimate uh, digital certificate. And then finally, if I was to go to Google, just to see what Google does, and look at their certificate. Google.com, it came from GTS. CA stands for Certificate Authority. Detail, SHA-256. And you may say, why, why aren't they using 512? Because 256 is, does the job for this. And you can see their public key, public key right here. Okay. And we will come back to this later on because you're looking at 256 and you're saying, Zico, Lynn Benton was using a 2048 bit key. Do you guys remember? And this is 256? Well, this is a completely different algorithm. You see this ECC? ECC is a newer algorithm. It's much more sophisticated than the older algorithms. And now we're capable of using shorter keys and better security. And that is a great deal because the length of the key is a tax we all pay. So longer keys take more resources and more time to produce. Shorter keys take less resources, less time to produce, but we want them to be safe. And people like you are smart and they're always finding a better way of doing the same thing. And ECC is a new type of algorithm that have figured how to use a shorter key and produce an exceptionally secure uh, key. So don't let this 256 bit key fool you. And I will bring you back here later on. And again, remember, this is a security course and we're talking security. Okay, back to slides. So we here, you see this script to key generate. We are generating our own, we're generating our own digital certificate. And in this lab, they produced a 1024. And I want you to know a 1024 is a very weak key. Nobody uses 1024, but for testing purposes, it's good enough. Administrative roles. So maybe we should do this and stop for today. Okay. Remember, this is week two. This is scheduled for next week. And what they're talking about, the next two topics, is do you want everyone to log on as administrator and have access to everything? Be authorized. Remember, authenticate, authorized. So do you want everyone to be authenticated, log on, and be authorized to do everything or do you want to limit what they can do? And I already talked about the difference between servers and switches and routers. Servers are accessed by a very large number of people, used by a very large number of people, and you want different authentication for these different individuals. Routers are only accessed, not used, used by many, and it's transparent. They don't really know they're going through switches and routers, but they're accessed by a small number of people. And usually those small number of people are system administrators. So as long as each one has a different account, you're good. And you can say, okay, you're a system administrator and you can do everything you want. So you don't really need to limit their power because they are a network system administrator. So I wanna stop here and see if this makes sense. Again, imagine you work for a company, there are three network system administrators. You each have a unique account and say, you know, I mean, that's my job. I need to be able to log onto this box and do what I want. Now, no one else inside that company, the company may be 2000 people, no one else is going to be allowed any kind of access to the switches and the routers. You can use them, but you're not gonna have access to them. So I don't know how used these next two features are where you're saying I want people to log on to a switch or a router and limit their access, but we're gonna cover them anyway. I'm just telling you, I don't know if they are widely used because we're talking about network devices 
and not computers that need to be accessed by lots of people. So this is what we're talking about, different roles. Okay. Limiting command availability. Okay. So we know we have different privilege levels, one through 15, and one gives you very little privilege and 15, uh, forgive me, your God, you can do anything you want in that box. And we have 16 different, that's because it's a four bit field, two to the power four is 16. So we have, you know, level zero through level 15. Uh, predefined for user level access privileges and reserved for enable mode privileges, basically system administrator, okay? And then you can create those levels. So they don't exist by default. Uh, 0, 1, and 15 exist by default, but the other ones you have to create. So you have to create level two, you have to create level five, you have to create level 10, and then you have to decide, you know, what can level five do? If you were to create a user with level five, what can that user do? And if you were to create a user with level 10, what can that user do? And I wanna show you the same file we were working with before everybody. So if I was to go back to where we were, chapter two, the very first file. And if we were to come down here, okay. We said username admin priv 15, cool everybody. So I'm saying I'm giving admin priv 15, which is the highest privilege. I could have said username is equal priv 10. And then when Zico logs on, Zico logs on with privilege 10. And I could have said username Frank, uh, priv five. And then when Frank logs on, Frank would log on with uh, level five privilege. And level five privilege will be limited to a number of commands and that's all Frank can do. Does that make sense, everybody? This is really it. There's nothing complicated, nothing fancy here. We have, uh, 16 different levels. Some of them are reserved, but the vast majority of them aren't being used. And you get to define them. And you get to decide which commands can be used with which level. And you can switch back and forth between these levels. Is there, is, do most companies come up with like a, a naming scheme for their admin accounts? Because, you know, you don't want you know, Frank or Zico to be the admin account, because if you have a corporate, you know, registry of who their admins are, you yeah. would know, oh, well, you know, what if they're using those as their name? Do most companies like obscure their admin account names or is that something because of the encryption levels that they don't really worry about? I can tell you for sure, Frank, that most companies don't use admin and they don't use administrator. Good, everybody? Because if you're a hacker, that's where you're going to start. Making sense? Say, okay. They must have an account called admin. Let me see if I can hack into it. They must have an account called administrator. So you just have an account called Zico, an account called Frank, and Zico, Frank have admin capabilities. And later on in this course, I will show you how we can link these uh, network devices, routers and switches to a, an AAA database basically a directory service. And most of you have taken CS240A and 240B or taking 240B from me. So you don't even have to have a local account because if you end up working for a company that has a uh, hundred switches and 10 routers, do you really wanna create 110 Frank accounts or Zico accounts? That's a terrible idea, right? Everybody and they have different passwords, etc. You just wanna use a directory service account. And we've also spent a lot of time talking about Active Directory and yes, iOS can use an Active Directory account. So you don't really wanna create a local account just for these network devices. You just wanna use your one and only directory account for everything, including routers and switches. And your company may have a standard to how to name those accounts, like, you know, first name, first character of last name, last name, first character of first name. And that is quite common. Uh, but I don't think you wanna put admin in the name because you're admin today, maybe you're not admin tomorrow. It's just Frank and Frank has admin capability 
to these boxes, but not to the other boxes. Does that answer the question, Frank? Yeah, it does. Okay. Ziggle, uh, wouldn't that be the same as the ACL if you just gener uh, generate the generic ACL with yes. user, then couldn't you just populate that with to all the router and switch? Uh, I, I heard what you said. I'm not sure I understand. So maybe you can clarify the, the question for me. I mean, um, like if you say that you are going to um, 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 set up a user account, yes. who set up a generic um, ACL that you can populate to the all uh, the um, um, router and switch. I'm, I'm failing to make the connection between an account and an ACL. So uh, maybe you can send me an email, camping. <laughs> Uh, and I will be happy to answer it for you. I'm just failing to connect the account with an ACL. Unless someone else knows what camping is talking about and can say it well, in different words. ACL is access control list, right? So yes. you, Yep, yep. You I know what an ACL is. It's a like a firewall rule. We're talking okay. networking here. So in the networking world, an ACL is a firewall rule that says this person is allowed in However, that person is not allowed out. Oh, okay. That, that's what an ACL is. On a, on a server, ACL could be different. ACL could say, you know, Zico has read permission but doesn't have write permission. Zico has this permission to this folder but has a different permission to a different folder. But in the networking field, we're talking it's binary. Okay. I think the difference is the, the device versus the person using the device. So are we talking about an ACL for a device? Right, well, that, that would be the, the fundamental difference. So the okay, ACL yeah, the very difference. good. We're talking, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right, for an IP. Right. Yep, so in the networking field, you know, the ACL is for an IP and in the server world, it's for a user. Okay. okay. Please send me an email camping. I'll be happy to answer that question. I just need to understand what the question is first. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Okay. So this is what we're talking about here, everybody. Limitations of privilege levels. So you can create uh, different privilege levels with different capabilities. I don't know what else to say. Okay. So if 15 is an administrator, you know, what do you want 10 to be? What do you want 11 to be? What do you want seven to be? And it doesn't mean you have to use all of them, everybody. And maybe you don't want to create any. In fact, if I was to go out in a limb, I'd say, I don't think this is a very popular thing that companies do. Uh, unless you have an apprentice, unless you hire uh, a student for the summer and you say, okay, we're gonna give you very few permissions. And then that will be a wonderful solution for that student for the summer. So let's say, you know, someone hires Cody for the summer and they want Cody to log on to these routers and switches, but definitely not make any changes, but they can run the show run command. Okay, I'm gonna create a privileged mode five and privileged mode five can only run the show command. And I'm gonna assign it to Cody. So when Cody logs on, guess what? This is all Cody can do. Just really quick to follow up on that. Or are those different privilege levels, one through 15, do they, are they already defined to what you can do? So for example, five, does, is it already implied you can only do no. X, Y, and Z, or do you define what no. that privilege level does? Zero, one, and 15 are defined, the rest are in Cody. Okay, so one through 15 are already. Uh, Zero, like one, 15 are defined, you know. Okay. Yeah, and, and you can probably redefine them if you want. Okay, uh, okay. But, but the rest of them are, aren't being used. And Cisco is saying, you know, you can, you can create different privileged levels with different capabilities, and then you can associate them with different people. Uh, again, just go back to what I was saying before. You know, if you're a network administrator, you want full privilege. And if you're not, not a network administrator, you have no business. You're with me, you have no business logging on to switches and routers. 
and you may have few exceptions like a summer student okay then this will be a good fit for the summer student okay so let's do a lab so i'm gonna move down to two I have the dogs in the room with me. <laughs> so if you hear some noise, that's what you're hearing. Hi puppies. When they learn some networking stuff, network security, because their border collies, they're pretty intelligent. So they'll probably keep up. Nope, not this guy. Yep, this guy. So this is a fairly small lab. So let's do it. Okay. So this is the same lab. And if you were to look next to line number two, okay, we're using the same passwords we used before. Console, the same lousy, easy to crack, easy to remember passwords. Console one, two, three, priv mode one, two, three. And we will be using these passwords for this entire chapter. Okay. So let's go ahead and log on to the router. Console one, two, three, E N. And you can see I'm logging. Do you see everybody? This is the logging feature I turned on before. Priv mode one, two, three. Okay. And show priv and 15 because I'm logged on from the console as an administrator. And if I was to exit, uh, console one, two, three, show priv, priv one. And if I was to type show, okay, ba -bum, show, well, how about question mark? Yeah. Then I, I have a, a small number of commands. I'm not even sure I can do all of these commands from here. So let's go back to privileged mode. Priv mode one, two, three. Okay, show priv. I am 15. I'm an administrator. I can do anything I want. That's very good. Okay, so let's see. I'm creating a level five, everybody. So priv exec level five, and I'm saying they can ping. That's the only command I'm giving this level five. So uh, and then I'm giving level five a password to password protect it. You are required to do that. So I gave it a password and I created a priv exact level 10 and 10 can reload and you can add more commands. So it's not one command. You can give them whatever number of commands you want. And I created a password for level 10. So let's copy and paste. County. Okay, I'm still logged on as an administrator and I'm gonna type enable two. Okay, and now I am in level two. Okay, enable five. This is how you jump from level to level. And remember you can create an account for Cody and then you can give Cody privilege five, 10, whatever. And I have a password and it's Cisco 555555 because it has to be 10 characters or longer. Okay. And remember, all I can do with level five is ping. So I can ping. Ping 192.168.1.2. And it works. Uh, let's see if I can do show run. And it's telling me it's an invalid input. It's I don't have the right to run show run. It's complaining, saying no can do. How about enable? Okay, I can go in there, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to do much. So let's see if I can reload. Hold on, five, five can ping. Okay, 
shouldn't have done this. So I, I, I must have done something wrong. So give me a second. I hope the concept is easy and straightforward. I don't think there's anything complicated about uh, privilege level modes. Um, and packet tracer has its limitations. So I'm gonna come back and paste the I'm redoing what I did. Okay. And I can type so priv and I'm 15 and enable five. So priv. Okay, I am level five and ping. I can ping. and um, enable 10, password, Cisco 10, 10, 10, Cisco 10, 10, 10, okay. And show priv, and I'm in priv 10, and forgive me for repeating myself, I can create a new account for Cody and give him level five. I can create new account for Frank and give him level 10. And that's what they would be limited to when they log on. And according to this, level five can ping and level 10 can reload. So let's see if level 10 can ping. Okay. so. Clearly I'm having some technical issues with this. I thought I tested it better, but it's not working for me. Okay. So down here it says create a new account for Zico and give Zico a privileged five. Okay, so let me do it. So run. Ah, I can show sure run. Okay. Um, so you can see I can show sure run because privilege 10 doesn't have show sure run capability. I can exit and come back in as level 15. Show sure run. And you can see Zico. Hold on. Copy. Okay, this makes sense. And you can see user Zico privileged five. And I beg you everybody, don't confuse the privileged five with secret five. Those are two different fives, right everybody? So username Zico privileged five is when you log on as Zico, Zico has privileged five. And secret five is the hashing we were talking about. And we said we're using uh, MD5 and MD5 generates 128-bit hash key. And it's not highly secure. Um, in 2020, it's um, somewhat secure, but not very secure hashing algorithm. Any questions on this? Focus on the concept, everybody. 
Okay, so we have these 15 different privilege modes. 0, 1, and 15 are used. 2 through 14 are not. And you can do whatever the heck you want with 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 14. And you can decide what commands you want each of these different privileges to have access to. And then people that log on with that privilege are constrained to whatever commands you enable that privilege to run. Not very popular, not widely used, uh, but if you ever have a, a summer student, maybe a brand new system administrator, you don't quite trust them and you don't want to give them the keys to the kingdom, uh, you can say, okay, you know, for the next three months you can view, but you can't change. And that would be a method to work around that. Questions? Okay. Do you want to do one more lab or you, you're good for today? It doesn't matter to me. We can do one or we're done for the day. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me either. Okay, then uh, any questions on anything we've done so far? One second, everybody. One second. We'll do one more. Just give me a minute. Okay, had to take care of some house stuff. Uh, so let me go back. The next topic actually is very similar and it would be good to get it out of the way. It's just a different way of limiting access. So let's go ahead and talk about it. And this is the role-based CRI. So instead of privileged mode that is allowed certain privileges, ah, you can see the dog in the background. This is Karuna, everybody. Karuna, say hi. <laughs> so uh, we have roles and the roles are limited to commands. Same exact concept, just a different way of going about it. And packet tracer is quite limited in terms of uh, how we can use these roles, but we can certainly talk about them and I can demo them at a high level. Okay. We talked about AAA. Anyone remembers what AA stands for? We use those acronyms a lot in networking, CIA and AAA. CIA is confidentiality, which is encryption, uh, integrity, which is hashing. We talked about hashing today and A for accessibility and balancing all of these uh, different elements with one another. And AAA is for authentication, authorization and accounting. And a different word for accounting is logging. And logging is so very important in IT. So very, very, very important. We have to log. We have to know who did what. And if you guys remember on Tuesday when I was going over the cybersecurity slides and I said, usually it takes six months for an enterprise to know that they've been hacked. Well, what do you have six months later? The crime is already being committed. All you have left at that point are your log files. That's all you have. And then enterprises will go and mine the log files to find out what did happen. So logging is very, very important uh, for several different reasons. Okay. IPS, IDS is intrusion prevention, intrusion detection, and we have a whole chapter in this later on. So this is the view. So we can create super views that consist of multiple views going back to limiting access. So we can create view one, two, three. Each view has 
specific privileges and then we can create a super view that consists of multiple of those views and then we limit the user to a view or to a super view does this sound familiar to what we we're talking about just five minutes ago okay yeah okay again in most cases this is my experience it's a binary decision you're a system administrator we're going to give you access to this router switch you can do whatever you want you're not you have no business logging on to there are some exceptions and we have two ways of handling those exceptions we can use a privilege level two three four five six seven through 14 or we can do views and so they accomplish the same goal two different ways okay it's nice to have options enable a view give it a name give it a password and then you attach commands to that view okay and then if we want we can create a super view that consists of multiple views and yes this is more flexible because of that super view capability that we can create views and then if we want we can bundle them together into a super view and then attach that super view to a user code is equal frank and that's all they can do and it's showing us how we do it and that's all i wanted to cover from the slides so let's do another lab and we'll call it a day because karuna wants to go for a hike so three and you can see you know they all have to deal with hardening the router security and then this is what we do okay here we are and you can see how long this lab is and that's because packet tracer has constraints it's it's a wonderful tool love it highly capable uh, but when it comes to certain areas it's very limited and role based it's very limited and please remember this when you do your labs yeah. all you have is packet tracer so if the lab was saying create a super view and packet tracer cannot create a super view i don't expect you to uh, create extensions for packet tracer so go as far as you can and once you hit the wall be creative but you hit the wall so let's come to the router same passwords console one two three priv mode one two three and you're going to remember those passwords because you're going to have to use them for each lab and we need to create a new model and we have to use aa authenticate authorize accounting slash logging so if I was to do AAA question mark, how about if I go to comp T, AAA question mark, then those are my options. Everybody, accounting, authentication, authorization, new model. So here we want to create a new model and we have a chapter, I believe, on AAA later on. So we'll dive into AAA accounting, authorization, uh, authentication later on in this course. So I want to create a new model. And I've created a new model. And I want to enable a view because we want to use views and password with mode one, two, three. Conf T. And I'm going to create a new view called test view. You can see it. Parser view 
test view. So that is the new view I am creating. And I want to password protect it. So secret. Do you guys remember what's unique about secret in iOS? What happens every time you use secret in iOS? Anybody? Oh, it encrypts that password, right? Thank you very much. So it encrypts it. What algorithm does it use? I don't know. It uses SSH. No, no. SSH is for communication. It's when you're when you have two devices talking to each other and you want to encrypt. Oh, oh yeah. Um... Someone said something. I didn't hear it. Secret five. Very good. It's, it's, it's MD5. But you're right. That's the same thing. Okay. It's MD5. And maybe that's where the five came from. I don't know. You, you're going to have to Google that and see if the five came from MD5. So anyway, uh, secret test one, two, three. And now you list the commands. Everybody, you list the commands that you want to be available for that view. So I'm going to type commands exec include show. And I'm going to redo it and say include ping. And end to get out of the view. And if I was to type Show run. Let me scroll down to where the view is. Here it is. Do you guys see it? Parser view, test view, secret five for MD5. This is the hash key, the 128-bit hash key. And we included show and ping. So when you enable this uh, test view view, that's all you should be able to do because that's the only commands we've included. And now instead of enable privilege, enable view. Do you guys remember enable privilege level? Similar, enable view test view. It's going to prompt me for a password, which is test123. And let me see if I can do anything else. I can ping. That should work. Good. I should be able to show, show run. No, nope. hold on. Ping and show. Ping and show. Hold on. I have ping and I have show. Show run. It should work. Is this a packet tracer thing? I don't know. It, it should work because here, yeah, I'll show you. Do show, I think, maybe? Do show? Nope. I'm in the right privileged mode. I'm in the right mode for show run. Okay. And when I do a question mark, it's showing me show, uh, but I am unable to run it. And I don't know if I did something wrong. Uh, exit. Console, I'll show you one more time what I'm talking about because the concept is easy. Priv mode one, two, three. So run. And here we are. So includes ping, includes show. Um, so let's try it one more time. And we want to enable view, test view, test one, two, three, question mark. This is what I can do. And show run. No, it doesn't want to work. What about when you do show question mark? What are your options? Good question. Okay. So do you have to explicitly tell it that you what show commands that you want to give it? You could limit it to that. I, I hold on, hold on. That's a good question. I don't think you can, Frank. 
I think, you know, once you give it show, you give it show. So you can't say, okay. yes, you can show this, but you cannot show that because show is a very big command, right? And you can use it for lots of different Yeah, there's, there's yeah. hundreds of show commands. Exactly. So uh, I'm going to ignore this. And I don't know if it's a packet tracer issue or not. What I'm really interested in is that you understand those two features we just covered in the last 15 minutes. Privileged mode and role-based. Both of them accomplish the same goal of being able to limit people to specific commands. Who wants to guess which of these two came first? Privileged mode or role-based mode? It's probably role-based. Okay. Why do you say that, Frank? I think it was probably privilege based. Yeah, very good. Probably privilege, yeah. Privilege yeah. came first. Remember, you know, this role base is more sophisticated because we oh, can okay. create super views, right? Yeah. So before it's like level two, that's all you can do. Level three, that's all you can do. And you couldn't give a user level two and level three. So a user, when you created a user, you're restricted to one level. So we didn't have that hierarchy. And this role based at the hierarchy where you have views and super views and you can give a user a super view and now they will have the capabilities of multiple views. Uh, I don't know how widely used they are. And now you understand them. You're unable to do labs with high sophistication because packet tracer doesn't give you that capability, uh, but you understand them. And if the need ever comes when you get a job and you become a senior network administrator, which you will become, and you have a, a summer student or a new employee, you're not 100% confident they should have full privilege. I want you to come back here and say, okay, I have two options here. Do I want to do option A or option B? And go from there. You guys have been really patient, two hours nonstop. That's pretty impressive. Is this good, useful? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, yeah. yeah it works. Any, any questions? I want you to dig a little bit deeper into the hashing algorithms, everybody. And it's really easy to do. You go to Google and, <laughs> and type hashing and go from there. But it's a concept you really want to be comfortable with because it's used so often, so often. In fact, I'll show you one more thing. I swear, just one more thing. I'm going to get out of here and go. It's just used so often and you want to understand exactly how it works and what's good, not so good. I'm going to stay here. So I'm going to go to the C drive. I'm going to go to program files. First, I want to go to Windows System 32. And I want to go to the calculator, right click on it, properties, and I don't have a, it's not digitally signed. This file is not digitally signed. However, almost all applications these days are digitally signed. So what does it mean a digitally signed? And let me show you. So let me come back here, go to 32-bit, Google, Chrome, application, right click, properties. You see the digital signature, everybody? So I'm going to click on it. This is telling me this is a digitally signed file. So what does that mean? What does it mean to you that this is a digitally signed file? It's legitimate. It's, it's legitimate. Why is it legitimate, Cody? You're right. Why? What makes it legitimate? Uh, a larger certificate authority verified okay. it as, as yep. universally it, it, recognizable. It is signed by a Google private certificate. Remember private public, what you can encrypt with one, you can only decrypt with one. So what does it mean that this file was digitally signed? What they do is they first produce a hash for that file. They take that entire exe file, doesn't matter, tiny, massive. They put it through a hashing algorithm. They produce a hash key and then the company will uh, encrypt the hash key with their private key. 
And then you and I, when we want to use that file, we will do this, the same thing. We will take the content of that file and we will hash it. And then we will use the company's public key to decrypt the hashed key. And then we'll compare the two keys to one another. And if they're the same, the file has integrity. And if they're different, then somebody did some monkeying with the file. And you can see we're using SHA-256. And if I was to, when I take a closer look at the digital certificate, go to detail and go to certificate. And this is what we're looking at before. So this is the SHA-256. And this is the public key that I would use to decrypt the hashed key. Otherwise, how would I know that this is what came from Google? So Google has to sign that with their private key. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. And you can play with this, but this is what it means that this file is digitally signed. So we looked at calculator, which wasn't digitally signed. And most applications, I'd say the vast majority of applications these days are digitally signed. And this is what they do. They hash the file and then they encrypt it with their private key. You've been very patient. This has been a good week one. So you guys enjoyed the fabulous, lovely spring weather we're having. And I will see you again in Tuesday. And you All have right. an assignment due this uh, Sun, you have an exam on Sunday and a lab on Wednesday. Okay. All right. Okay. Goodbye, Bye, everybody. Isabel. Have a good have a nice weekend. weekend. Thank you, you too. Have a good enjoy weekend. The, enjoy the weather and stay safe.